Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar organized for the CRAM modeling and the geospatial data community of practice. My name is Annabel Molera, and I'm coordinating the CRAM modeling community of practice. And I'm here today to introduce you the panelists and facilitate the question and answer section. Um, I, we also have Maria Camila, who is going to help us um, with the technical issues and also with the questions. And also we have Matthew Reynolds here, um, that is the lead of the crop modeling community of practice, who is going to select the questions to make to the panelists. Before we start the webinar, um, I would like to test that you can hear and see my screen properly. So if not, please type that on the chat. Excellent. Um, we are very happy to have so many people from around the world. I see that right now we have almost 300 people connected, which is amazing. Today, our speakers are going to present some examples of secondary data they are using uh, within the CGIR, the crop modeling uh, CGIR researchers. The secondary data sources are widely used for crop modeling purposes, as you all might know, because sometimes primary data is not complete or is not in the proper ontologies. And we, so we did a webinar last year uh, in collaboration uh, with Gerrit Hogenboom about minimum data requirements. So you can go to the Big Data Platform website. You can check all the webinars we have been doing. We have also done webinars about DSAT and about AppSyn and WOFOS models. So this is a webinar about like secondary data source. Today, uh, with the imposed lockdowns around the world due to the, to the coronavirus crisis, um, researchers are facing challenges of conducting field trials and collecting primary data. So while the field collected data, of course, is the best uh, for using in crowd modeling uh, activities, some of the data requirements uh, might be filling by using this um, secondary data. Our presenters today are going to introduce you in the secondary data sets, the ones they are using. They are going to do some final remarks. Then we are going to the question and answer section. So please, if you have some questions that have not been re uh, replied uh, during the presentation, you can type them in the question and answer like question section. In So here you can see it in, the, in this platform. I'm really pleased to welcome you today, our experts for this webinar. Yewuku, probably you all know him, is the co-founder of the CGIR platform from Big Data in Agriculture. He's also the leader of the Geospatial Data Community of Practice and a senior research fellow at IFPRI in Washington, D.C. And Kai Sonder is the Geographic Information System Unit Head um, at CIMIT in Mexico. And he's also the co-leader of the crop modeling community of practice. So, Yewu, I'm going to turn it over to you to start the presentation. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Annabelle. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining today. And yeah, I briefly turn on my uh, webcam just to say hi, uh, but to conserve the web uh, bandwidth, uh, so I'm going to turn it off and only showing the slide from now on. We just introduced ourselves, and now let us tell you who we think you are uh, joining this webinar today. Uh, you are likely a researcher, uh, not necessarily a professionally trained crop modeler, uh, but who plan to use crop modeling as one of the research tools. And you are probably ideally at the stage of the following. For example, you have already identified uh, your research question and already justified why crop modeling approach is necessary in your study. Uh, you already defined your research location so that you have some ideas of how farmers manage their plot and what level of crop yield you can expect to see uh, with specific treatment or, or uh, technology you want to apply. And also you have probably identified important data gaps that secondary data can potentially address. So we are, we are going to talk about that. However, it's also very important to uh, note here that not all the research questions can be addressed by secondary data. I'm currently working on some of the projects in West Africa happen to be uh, trying to understand the applicability of new technology uh, hasn't been applied in the region yet. So there is no real secondary data to replace primary data collection. In that case, it's not going to work. Uh, but other cases, if you are missing, like so it, for example, soil data or weather data, uh, maybe there are other sources that we can uh, replace and see if they can perform um, appropriately. And that's what we are going to talk about today. So what data do you need for crop modeling? And yeah, as Annabelle mentioned, uh, we started this webinar series last year uh, with 
uh, Garrett and Tom presenting minimum data requirement for crop modeling. If you missed, uh, that webinar is still available to rewatch uh, from the Big Data Platform website. I borrowed this slide from the presentation. Uh, there are mainly four buckets or four kinds of aid, uh, input data uh, we expect to prepare for crop modeling studies. Uh, one is uh, soil conditions and weather data and genetics, uh, like variety characteristics, and also management events, uh, planting, irrigation, fertilizer, etc. So those are the things, uh, those four areas, the blue shape, uh, the rectangles on the top, and that, that's the area we think uh, secondary data may be able to help fill the gap. Kai will tell you what we think um, is the scale that we are going to talk about. Yes, good morning, good evening, good night. My name is Kai Zonda. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Good. <laughs> um, so I'm a crop model user, maybe also a data scientist nowadays. So a big part of my time goes to looking at data and finding data and seeing what you can use, validating it. One of the important things to decide first, is obviously, at what scale do you want to work? In theory, it all goes down to the plot because even if you do globally gridded modeling, you're still working on one plot or you're running models that represent one plot, only that the size goes considerably up, can be, I don't know, five by five, 10 by 10 kilometers, half a degree or so. But at the end of the day, experimental plot, that's the ideal case. Normally we get much better data. We know this, this plot, we can collect our own data. Um, then when it gets to field, multiple management zones on one farm or several farms or in, in an area, much more complicated. You already have, may have different soils. So lots of diversity, uh, more challenges. If you have a farm with multiple fields, it still goes up. If you look at watersheds, which is a unit where many people work or a landscape already then, from small to large, can be a country, can be a region, can be globally. Today we'll mostly focus on the first four, but a lot of the data that we're going to mention is also going into uh, country, state, district, anything in between up to global. And I think Jebo mentioned that already, but we're going to have a, a webinar in the near future that specifically concentrates on, on gridded modeling, which is a bit different, but Basically, everything goes down to one spot represented here. Kai and I will be kind of going back and forth uh, for different sections of slide, and the weather data uh, is will be presented by Kai. Minimum, minimum, what we normally need is minimum, maximum temperature, rainfall, and radiation. Um, the first three, even if you have your own station, normally easy to get, especially for historical data, when it comes to solar radiation, it's already a bit more trickier because CIMIT who maintains quite a few uh, weather stations on our research uh, plots, research stations. For a long time, we only took the three basic ones. Um, then at some point, radiation, wind, and some others, humidity came along. So it's always a bit tricky. I'm going to go into where to find weather climate data. Uh, mostly concentrating now on uh, historic data or current data, not so much the future one that goes more into the gridded ones, but there's also a few options to find those. So um, the best case obviously is always when you have uh, a weather station that you ideally manage yourself, then you know about the quality and the time series, it's always an issue. There's plenty of sources with national and meteorological systems with institutions in some countries, like here in Mexico, um, national research institutions share data. The World Meteorological Organization shares station data. And in many cases, this has been curated or has been checked, so you can trust it a bit more. In some cases, you have to have a close look. It's always a problem when you use secondary data, you have to know where it comes from and you have to make the assumption that sometimes it's not ideal. But anyway, whenever you can get station data for a specific location, that's perfect. Here are two that you can use, uh, one from Texas A&M. Stations, IAMs, you can download 
you can search countries, you can search areas, and if you're lucky, you will find a station that is really close to you. It depends a bit on the topography, obviously. If you're in a wide flat area and your research interests in that wide flat area, things like temperature may not uh, differ that much. Rainfall is a bit trickier, obviously, and the same goes for the rest. But if you're in a topography, Ethiopia, Mexico here, where one or two kilometers can already be a thousand or more meters higher or lower, then you're in trouble, then uh, other sources, maybe uh, remote sensing based sources may be better. The NOAA, NASA in the US also, they maintain the global historic climate network. You can find plenty of those all over the world and you can download time series there. And like I said, in many countries you can find that weather institutes, climate institutes share those online, not always, but uh, you can find those. NASA Power, the next one, that is a classic for the modeling community. We still use that a lot. Uh, in the past, we often had temperature and rainfall for specific locations, but as I mentioned, we didn't have solar radiation, so NASA Power was one of the top places to go for. One of the interesting things here is you can get point data. You can also get a few different. And NASA Power has the luxury that it gives you a data already in different formats that are up for different modeling um, softwares, modeling applications. If you look at ICASA, that's a, a standard nowadays propagated by several institutions that do crop modeling. So that one you can ingest directly in most larger uh, modeling softwares. The resolution is 60 by 60 kilometers, um, which is not ideal. Again, if you're in a country with a very diverse topography, but for many years, this was what everybody was using. We're still using it, it's still a very good source. It's validated, it's a combination of remote sensing and extrapolation methods and um, uh, station data. So very recommendable. Not always we use direct input for crop modeling, but uh, if you're working on drought or uh, weather-based insurances, for example, or you want to look at hydrological modeling, then often um, just rainfall is enough or basic rainfall and temperature data. This is a very interesting one that's been around for a couple of years for Africa, but also nowadays global applications, chips, rainfall generated from remote sensing sources and combined with station data wherever, whenever available um, in some regions of the earth. Coverage with station data, unfortunately, is not the best, so this doesn't always work out, but that is also improving nowadays with lots of citizens feeding into amid. So five kilometer resolution daily data goes back to the 1980s. And uh, recently they have added max and min temperature, also developed from remote sensing from global models, validated and combined with station data, almost the same time frame. 1983 to 2016 at the moment, but as the background data comes from era five, I assume it will be, it will continue. We can continue using this. Tamsat has something similar, um, 1983 to the delayed present. They always need a couple of days to process this. Comes from the UK, also a very interesting source. For many of these not directly measured ones, even though they are calibrated afterwards, it's often good if you have local time series to check, to validate, to calibrate sometimes. Um, we used to have a source similar to this some years ago, TMM, and for some locations this worked very well, for some other locations it didn't work perfectly, but uh, a very good source and easily accessible. And now um, this was for me personally a game changer in the last couple of years. The European Union, with its Copernicus program, they have made a lot of investments in satellites. Many of us are using Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, now Sentinel-3, and the follow-up missions for different types of data that have made freely available. And one of the big parts of this is climate data. And you can get, for example, the ERA-5 data set, basically from 1981 to present. You can get hourly data, you can da get daily data, you can get monthly data any time frame you want. Resolution is very good, about 10 kilometers, and you can get quite a few um, 
parameters here, temperature, wind, precipitation, solar radiation, a few more. It's easily accessible. It, at the moment, a bit of skills. Um, you need to learn a bit of scripting, but there are many tutorials on this webpage that can show you that. And uh, it's accessible. You can implement this nowadays in R and Python and so, several things and pull these data down for points. You can get gridded data for the whole globe, for, for a country, for a specific region. So very, very recommendable, has made a big change in terms of uh, data availability for us. This is a, a reanalysis product, which is also validated against real data. So you also have to be a bit careful, obviously, because uh, it is derived from models, but then check, but uh, on a global scale and looking at the time frame, looking at the amount of parameters, this is probably one of the best data sets you can get for inputs into, into models. We are using this amply now. In our community. And then there's another one, um, the EU in this case, they came up with ARC ERA 5, which is related to the ERA 5 one, but more specifically made already for agricultural users. It's also a reanalysis data set, same resolution. It goes back even a bit more, and it will go back in history a bit more in the, in the near present. At the moment, I think it goes up to 2018, 2019. It's daily data. It has temperature, wind precipitation, solar radiation, humidity, vapor pressure, and some others. And you can also, again, through scripting or direct data download, you can download point point series for multiple locations. You can download grids. You can get some of this data in um, spatial data formats, NetCDF, for example. So you need a few skills around there. But I also heard from the people who are behind us that they are working towards making it easier access. So simply like NASA Power entering some coordinates or uploading a, a list of, of coordinates, and then you can pull the data in an easier way. And uh, here, some colleagues in, in Italy, they have several other options for um, rainfall data that also go back partly 10, 20 years at pretty decent resolution. Again, like I was saying before about chirps and others, you need to uh, look a bit at validation data. You need to look a bit at calibrating for your specific locations, but there's plenty of options out there if you want to look at drought frequencies or a specific rainfalls for a specific location anywhere. So Daymet, um, this is a regional one, but very interesting, very good quality. It basically covers uh, Northern America, so down from Alaska, Canada, Continental US, uh, Mexico, luckily for me, I'm based in Mexico and I do a lot of work here. So that's why I became aware of this and I've been using it. Um, also Puerto Rico and Hawaii, one kilometer daily resolution, 1980 to present basically. And it has also temperature, precipitation, vapor pressure and some others. Very interesting. You can also download specific points. You can download lists of points. You can download tiles and you can download the whole data set, which is relatively large. But in software like R, um, you can easily manipulate and extract it. And then when it comes to weather and climate, last but not least, um, there's quite a number of uh, commercial providers around nowadays that we've all used and are evaluating. There's quite a few more. So if I don't mention those, sorry, but these are the three main ones that we've been using. And they all have a, a set of data can be Daily weather can be short or longer term predictions, can be historical data also going back 20, 30 years, forecasts, ups, and a lot of other products. Everybody should have a look. If you see something that you find useful for your work, uh, contact these people, talk about the financial implications, but these are partly quite interesting. Um, one of the big advantages, for example, that you can get daily data, which most of the free sources don't cover that well, and also the the predictions if you're working on uh, working with farmers and your commercial growers, so this can be an interesting alternative. Back to Jevo for soils. Uh, yes, oh, thanks, Kai. So let's talk about soil data a little bit, uh, soil properties. Uh, in fact, before the webinar, we collected some of the questions from you, and yeah, most of the questions were in soil data and weather data. Yeah, the weather is probably a little bit easier, and there are lots of sources out there. Uh, soil is a little bit more limited, but there, there, are, there could be different approaches here. The first, if we are talking about more point-based modeling, 
uh, studies that as we set in the scope. The soil profile is really what you need for most of the crop modeling, process-based crop modeling applications. And ESRI has this wise global soil property database, uh, currently has about 10,000, more than 10,000 actually measured soil profile, collective soil profile and analyzed in the lab and covering about 150 countries. So yeah, I, I, I'm not going to click on the link <laughs> for now, but yeah, so those, uh, those databases can be really useful, especially if you are, again, lucky that uh, those databases include some of the stations or, or location nearby your research site and also have similar soil kind of characteristics, then uh, this will be probably the best source. Uh, beyond that, uh, there is a soil grid database, also a lot of people are already using it, and I think it's been going, uh, it's been around for several years, and they have been improving underlying interpolation method and also high, uh, making it higher and higher resolution. And there are uh, journal articles out there explaining uh, the methodology in, in detail. And there is a very nice web-based platform just recently updated to, to help you visualize the data around the world and uh, select the site and download data directly from the website. So I highly encourage you to take a look. Uh, from IPRI, and uh, I, uh, we worked with Columbia University a few years ago uh, when soil grid was still at uh, one kilometer resolution, and now they are providing data at 250 uh, meter resolution. Uh, we converted that soil grid data into DSET soil profile format. And yeah, at the time, actually, a 10 kilometer, uh, one kilometer resolution was great, uh, but it was too much for us to handle. So we aggregated to 10 kilometer. And yeah, we haven't uh, revisited that yet. But uh, so soil grid, 10 kilometer, uh, one kilometer resolution of soil grid, previous generation of soil grid uh, has been um, kind of converted to this set profile. And, and there is a open data that, uh, repository providing that data set. Uh, uh, additionally, there are some kind of complementary data sets out there from different providers, and I, I think it's also good to mention those here. Uh, the one is from Future Water, the high hydro soil. Uh, this is reanalyzed soil grid data. So they, they also took, I think, one kilometer resolution of soil grid data from a couple of years ago and converted specifically for soil hydrologic uh, properties like a wilting point and the field capacity, etc. And they, 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 that data set is available at one kilometer resolution globally. Uh, it's not open data per se, uh, but it is available uh, when you uh, email the author of the uh, of the, this data set. So again, the, uh, if you are going to use soil grid for crop modeling and, and needing uh, more information, more detailed data on hydrologic properties, uh, yeah, uh, I recommend to take a look at that data. Another important data set I, I also personally found really useful is uh, the Global Yield Gap Atlas uh, also published on reanalyzed data on soil grid, specifically on routing depth, uh, effective routing depth uh, for Africa. Uh, it's not global, unfortunately, yet. But especially for Africa, they look uh, reanalyzed and they apply some rules on soil properties in soil grid and what will be the realistic routing depth that uh, crop modelers uh, can really use in our modeling application. So yeah, those three data set probably can go together, especially if your site is in Africa uh, to come up with more updated and realistic soil profile for your site. Uh, and lastly, uh, when we uh, started this journey of using secondary data for the field when we don't have any data, a uh, uh, while ago we came up with this idea that uh, maybe we can create uh, generic soil profiles that are not specific for any specific field, but that could be still a good starting point. Uh, we, we look at three characteristics, uh, texture, soil rooting depth, and uh, soil fertility, the organic carbon content. Uh, so uh, for each of these characteristics, uh, we define the mid, low, medium, high, and three by three by three. So we came up with 27 soil profiles. Um, actually, uh, here when, when I said we, uh, it was collaboration uh, together with John Dimes, uh, Dr. John Dimes uh, at that time at Equisat. And yeah, it, it, it was something that we didn't think it was so popular, but yeah, we, we still see a lot of people are still using it. I think this could be still useful data set uh, for kind of uh, starting point when you don't really have any uh, uh, reliable soil data 
space yet. And this is also available from the data repository uh, uh, provider here. Okay, next uh, is a cropping calendar. So when you have weather data and soil data, now you need to have some ideas on when farmers plant and harvest. So I will I'll bring it back to Kai. This is the tricky one because, um, well, if you're working on a specific plot in your neighborhood, you normally know pretty well um, when the seasons are and what the cropping pattern is. But once you go up into landscape level, maybe work on a country we specifically can't travel to, especially now, then uh, it gets a lot trickier. There are a couple of sources we can go into and you can also do a couple of rules. You can feed remote sensing data into that. One very interesting data set, one of the few I think that actually exists globally um, is this one here. It provides a lot of data on specific crops, basically grids that you can access and download, but also graphs um, for specific locations or regions that show you when uh, the normal cropping season is, when normal planting um, times and normal harvesting times are, and when you expect the crop to develop. Obviously, in some countries like India, where you have sometimes three or more seasons that can be um, problematic, but still covers this. But basically, for any location on Earth and most of the major crops, you have um, grids that show you in which part of the year a crop is planted and at which time of the year the crop is harvested. And there's a lot of additional data in there. So you can access it like that. You can access it on the web platform. And you can get ideas for this in many countries. If you know that your uh, crop is rain fed, you can also go to generic data sets on like world clim on, on climate data and you can plot something like this. And this will give you an idea when the rainy season starts. Uh, if it's irrigated, it can be a bit more complicated than you need additional data. But for most rainfall sources, you can generate this easily for most places on Earth. No spatial data in this one, but still a very good uh, resource. FAO put this together uh, with a lot of partners. So for most crops, for most countries, it will give you an idea when these crops grown under which um, modalities. And nowadays we have the luxury with uh, cloud computing, with tools like Google Earth Engine, with access to incredible amounts of free satellite remote sensing based data, climate data. Uh, we can take a di some different approaches. Some of our colleagues from Carla and Amy have taken that one. And also, as most people carry phones nowadays, we can use those as sources. So our colleagues at Ecarda produced this very interesting uh, application for Google Earth Engine. Basically, um, now also related very much to the COVID-19 outbreak. They were wondering about which changes do you have? Are there any problems popping up with harvesting if farmers can't get to the fields or if there are no seasonal uh, labor available for specific places. So they basically incorporated something where you can see for days, months, uh, and specific years, you can see which crops are progressing, uh, which areas are being harvested, uh, and, and so on. So that's an option you can always do. You can do a time series with, let's say, NDVI values, and you can identify this. Um, so Global Cropman Monitoring Tool from our colleagues at IMI, a similar platform. And here also you can see they monitor basically how in different areas, in this case, South Asia, India, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh are developing. And you can follow these. You can do that backwards in history. You can look at specific years. You can see patterns. And you could also, in specifically dry or wet years, where the, the season shifted a bit, maybe you can identify all those times and you can derive um, specific planting and harvesting windows uh, maturity of the crop from from these sources and then um, something we often do you do rule-based planting date selection so you look at the specific weather data you have as an input for your model for that uh, specific time and year and then often you can see once the, um, the parameters for soil moisture for initial conditions when a certain amount of, of water is available to the crop, then you can use that to, this, to have the system decide when to start the, the growing season. You can ask farmers, they can do citizen science, crowdsourcing, um, taking pictures. How do the fields at the moment look? 
obviously this is not so easy under conditions of uh, curfews and so on, but there's plenty of uh, additional systems. You can do telephone surveys and phone surveys. Most people nowadays own a, a phone with a camera and our colleagues at IFPRI, for example, have been using that for insurance projects and some other purposes, but this can also be adapted to this. Um, I've seen some examples where things like Google Maps images have been harvested. If you know at which point of the year they've been taken, you can use those ones. The same goes for um, management practices, also a very tricky one. If it's your local area, you normally know pretty well, but if it goes to larger scale, operations there's a very recent data set so the pick global grid data set on tillage for crops um, there's a couple of colleagues like stanford university and michigan they've been working on remote sensing based tillage detection methods can be used to detect just start of the season or tillage in general but we've also been looking at which areas uh, cover uh, are covered by zero tillage or reduced conservation tillage conservation agriculture if you look at variety characteristics, um, that's also a tricky one. You can use the Guardian search engine, which basically covers all the data generated by the CGIR open data by all the CGIR centers. And there you can find uh, a lot of trial data, uh, variety characterizations. You can look at journal articles, literature reviews, and you can obviously always talk to local experts, breeders, agronomists. I always do that when I work in a certain area and I know somebody or I find somebody who works in that area and I contact them by email, by phone, by other options, and I ask them for some input, either a time series for a specific variety or um, other data they may have. You can also look uh, in the internet, often you find recommendations by extension services that often covers minimal uh, data we need to characterize specific varieties or uh, crops we use for this. Fertilizer is very similar. Also, I've done that quite a few times when you um, want to work run crop models for a country that you don't have too much information about, you haven't been there, but you're still working on it. Uh, you can do a literature review relatively quick, find interviews, surveys, points, extract uh, data there. Often national agricultural systems, they have uh, recommended rates of fertilizer for specific crops. You can find fact sheets uh, online. Um, seed companies often do the same for specific varieties they are selling and the Ministry of, of Agriculture. Is the same. Breeding information the same. You can find variety management recommendations from companies, from the NARS, from the public sector. And again, you can always contact local experts, breeders, agronomists, extensionists. This is also very important when you're validating uh, the outputs of your crop modeling at the end. It's always good to have people who really know who grow these crops, who accompany people who grow crops in specific areas, to have a look at the results and tell you whether that is reasonable or not. And back to Joe. Yes, uh, and then irrigation. I think it's getting more and more complicated. And irrigation, especially for the monitoring, we, we didn't really find a lot of good monitoring data per se. There are data set showing uh, statistical data like from FAO Aquastat, um, and there is a FAO global map of irriga irrigation area called GMIA, and it was you know, the popular and a lot of people have been using it as a baseline, but it hasn't been updated since uh, the previous version, the latest version is still around year 2005. There is a new uh, data set came up uh, a couple of years ago uh, on this global approach to estimate irrigated areas. They added some additional analysis on top of GMIAA, uh, including remote sensing based kind of NDVI anomalies. And yeah, it's, it's been a little bit more up to date uh, around the year of 20, 2012, and it's also available at grade one kilometer resolution. Yeah, again, these are showing irrigation extent and where we have evidences of data of irrigation, but not necessarily showing this season farmers are irrigating. So this uh, has to be used with a little bit of caution. And there are some other useful data sources too, as Kai briefly mentioned, uh, although we are still not able to freely move to the field. Uh, there are a lot of surveys are going on even now uh, using phone. And it's often called CATI, a computer assisted telephone interviewing. And uh, I'm, I'm at IPRI and a lot of my economic colleagues are using this as a main data collection tool these days um, to ask farmers and to ask our uh, beneficiaries how their lives have been impacted by COVID-19, etc. So maybe we can piggyback on those opportunities and see 
if they can ask some questions that we really want answer to. And then there are also national representative household surveys out there that could also provide some useful information, for example, fertilizer types and fertilizer application rate and the use of improved varieties, et cetera. This will require some skills. I mean, as a crop model, I found it a little bit difficult to analyze. I always rely on my economist colleagues. So yeah, make a friend with your economist colleagues. And, and uh, maybe there are some uh, recent, especially recent data, recent household survey data available, then this might be also helpful to set your baseline condition. And then there are some other commercial data products also becoming available. Uh, the, the two data that we mentioned here, the one is called uh, Vandersat. Uh, it's a soil moisture mapping data product. Uh, the company based in the Netherlands providing uh, five centimeter depth of a sensing product, a microwave sensing extrapolated to 40 centimeter soil depth, uh, monitoring soil moisture uh, daily updated 100 meter resolution. Another data set we have been uh, using is IBM seasonal probability forecast data. Uh, it provides uh, six months daily forecast for those three variables, uh, rain, TMS, and TMIN, uh, actually as well as uh, temperature average, uh, and they are providing monthly update. And there are some other remote sensing um, inputs too. Uh, Kai, uh, would you like to present just briefly about this? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is a, also a relatively new field. Um, there's quite a few players, startups that are doing work like this. Some of this has been going on for a long time, looking at uh, NDVI time series, for example, but companies like Grow Intelligence or Atlas AI or uh, Descartes Lab, just to name a few. So what they are doing, basically, they look at larger areas, sometimes for commercial purposes, sometimes for um, food security, famine warning. There's FuseNet, for example, has been doing that also, something similar for many years. So they look at crop development in a specific area, looking at satellite images, comparing to previous years, taking uh, statistical data, county level, district level, any kind of crop yield, crop production data, they relate that. Uh, with statistical methods to uh, satellite images and then give yield predictions. In some cases, it works pretty well, and it's always an option you can do because data is nowadays freely available and more very fascinating data there. You can nowadays purchase daily data at three meters and below resolution, so you can get incredible detailed time series. But if you look, if you use things like Sentinel, Landsat, Going back modest, then you can get 20, 30 years nowadays of data, and you can do that based. You can combine statistical and process-based crop modeling, which some of these companies do, and some uh, universities, some researcher groups do. Data assimilation, you can use, for example, if you're crop modeling on a field, taking some of the parameters, if you want to do very detailed crop modeling, like leaf area index, you can do that with drone images, but also leaf area index derived from high resolution or mid resolution satellite images using that for forecast or as an input into your model. And Jaro already mentioned one is that something we are keen at the moment to explore because soil moisture obviously is super important for crop development and is a very important input to the model that we can never really cover. Uh, some years ago when I first started looking into this, the resolution was like 50, 60 kilometers. Now apparently there are sources that bring that down to a very reasonable resolution. So We'll get back to you in the near future once we have evaluated this. Back to Joe. Okay, so um, finally, uh, so final remark. Uh, we want to wrap up this presentation with just a few remarks. Uh, first, use the secondary data with a caution. Again, uh, starting with your research question, you will need to think really hard uh, if the specific secondary data can be helpful or not. Um, and and if, if you're interested in weather variability effect, for example, you can use historical cropping calendar as the source. Um, and yeah, you will need to probably monitor how cropping calendar might change this season uh, because of weather pattern this season, not looking at the historical trend. Um, and, and evaluation is always necessary. And, and don't forget to read documentation. And uh, oftentimes, if, if the data set has been also around for a while, you may find some literature that discuss its performance and limitations in journal articles. So we, we, yeah, we keep finding comparative analysis results, et cetera. So yeah, that could be, that there, there might be some information to help you uh, decide whether this works for you or not. A second, talk to your colleagues in this community as 
the source. Um, so when you have a field level study and the data comes at global and regional level, uh, you can safely assume uh, that the data hasn't been well evaluated at your particular site uh, by the data uh, developer. Uh, however, there might be someone else in the community have used it for their location or for similar kind of geography and willing to share their experience. Uh, that may not be featured in journal article per se, but uh, they, they might be more open to discuss with you what they found is pros and cons of the data set. So make full advantage of this community of practice uh, uh, where Kai and I represent uh, today, for example, and also join various mailing lists and Facebook groups and ask questions and discuss a uh, highly uh, recommended way of getting the answer you've been asking uh, if this good enough. And there is no real good answer to that, uh, but we all need to kind of uh, find it together. Uh, lastly, as we mentioned, we will organize a few other follow-up webinars uh, after this, uh, especially on grid-based modeling. So some of the questions we got were around grid-based modeling. So we will save those questions today and we will address them in the, uh, the next webinar. And we will also have another webinar uh, on Guardian and CG Labs, a uh, very cool data science platform. And yeah, that will be also coming up in a couple of weeks. Please stay tuned with us. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yawan Kai, for your excellent presentation. And if you want to be informed about other webinars that we are organizing, just uh, follow us in, in our social media, follow like Big Data Platform. You can find there the information about the upcoming webinars. We are going to move very quick to the question. So Yawu and Kai, I ask you to please um, reply as brief as possible because we have a lot of questions. So let's start with the first question. Someone from the audience is interested in hearing more about how you all decide what secondary data sources are of sufficient accuracy for use in your work. Uh, so you mean how to assess the accuracy of the secondary data source? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Right, so again, that, that's really hard. Uh, in, in this case, uh, we are assuming you're not being able to collect data from the field. So yeah, you, you just have to have your, you have to do your own due diligence. I mean, again, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, talk with your colleague and also trying to get data uh, from um, your colleague or extension agent on the on the location, I mean, if that's possible, to the extent possible. And you can do some backcasting, uh, collecting data from the same source for the last year or previous years when you actually have data and compare the uh, evaluation, uh, do, the, do some evaluation using those known data and yeah, assume this will be also more or less reasonable this season. But yeah, I mean, that, that's really hard. And that's exactly the point of kind of our, uh, starting point here. Secondary data source is literally secondary plan B here. Uh, so yeah, you, you really need to be careful uh, what it does. And yeah, again, uh, I, I can't stress high enough that uh, this all depends on the research question. Uh, if you really need very precise measurement of soil moisture, then yeah, you, you have to probably accept the range of error you will get from secondary data source, unfortunately. So yeah, I mean, again, it's not easy to answer. Uh, but yeah, by addressing, by looking at previous data available uh, to you and also uh, just uh, looking at literatures and talk with your colleagues, uh, you might have more reasonable answer. To so then um, this also answers the second question, if whether it will be possible to do mm -hmm. entirely crop modeling using remote sources and whether this will provide accurate results. Oh yeah, probably not. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it also goes back to the research question. Uh, what you're trying to estimate is exactly what farmers will harvest. That you know, probably not. Uh, but if you are going to, uh, if you are interested in kind of yield pattern or, or kind of temporal changes uh, compared to last year or previous season, then yeah, it, it might still work um, using remote sensing based weather data and this kind of interpolated soil surface. Uh, if you have uh, at least quality information on those, uh, you could get um, kind of reasonable differences uh, compared, expected differences compared to last year. Uh, but yeah, again, it will be difficult to assume that will be exactly what farmers will be getting in the field. So yeah, I mean, to the extent possible, um, yes, but also no, it will be difficult. How to validate the simulated results obtaining using secondary data? Right, so yeah, it's also a similar question. And yeah, again, uh, we, we all, as a crop model, it's really heartbreaking. Uh, we have to live without, uh, just imagining we have to 
uh, study without having collected data. So yeah, we have to, yeah, again, adding to what I previously mentioned, uh, a little bit of triangulation could be useful. Like for example, it's not probably, it's not likely that nobody in the world will be able to collect field. Maybe there are some similar geography or similar area or similar technology being tested uh, in other places. So yeah, this, this network and community of practice is really, really useful um, to collect those kinds of intelligence together. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, this is not easy. Uh, conventional way of uh, like getting root mean square error, or comparing simulation observation in this case is really difficult uh, because yeah, we are just assuming that it will be not possible. Um, so yeah, we have to come up with other different ways to collect data together first and uh, fine tune our model with available data and use as, as much quality data as possible for this season. And yeah, we, we, we will hope that it will be more accurate than uh, just, you know, uh, blindly <laughs> making predictions. Um, but yeah, I think that will be interesting to see toward the end of the season, how where we are and how good our estimation could have been uh, compared to available data by that time. Okay, so the next question um, is from some of your colleagues at CIMIT and say, can we have a standardized global soil and climate data for using crop models? I know there are some out, but there are several versions and in some cases studies are using different versions and hence difficult to compare model outputs. Right, exactly. So Kai, do you want to answer? Yeah, I can do that. I think, well, it's an issue of getting together. I think ACMEP, for example, um, they've already done that a few times. They've put together certain sets and shared them with their wider community so that everybody runs based on the same input data. So within this community and the wider crop modeling community, I think it should be easy to sit together and define what would we like to have, what is the best available at the moment, and then uh, make that available. So maybe something based on Agira 5, for example, plus uh, soil grids 250 in a, in a way that you can, that everybody can ingest it. That's definitely a very valid point and something we probably need to invest some time in and see how we can put it together and make it open to everybody. Right, and I would, that also depends on the, the research question. I, I, I hate to say it, it depends, but it, it literally uh, there there are reasons that there are multiple data sources available because uh, each of them was produced and generated for specific focus. Uh, so I think it will be really important to again read documentation and see what other research, researchers use that for different types of studies. And yeah, I would recommend trying to find the studies that have say, similar objective, even similar region, uh, uh, if even better, and see what choices they made uh, for those. And, and also, I mean, if you don't find, if you really stuck on what to do, and yeah, we uh, we we are happy to help. Uh, have to show you what available, what might be the best one uh, compared to others. The next question comes from the UC Davies, and how do you use a point-based crop model on a landscape scale? So that's exactly where grid-based modeling comes in. Yeah, I mean, so it, it, it will be really so difficult next... to, to, yeah, so yeah, I, I will push it for <laughs> grid. So you will have entire webinar uh, addressing that issue, so uh, let's get back to that. Okay, so then let's move to the next one. So how can I get usable secondary data of soil salinity? I have data of water salinity, but require secondary data of soil salinity. Mm. So like for example, soil grid has some soil properties on soil salinity and acidity. And actually I, I don't have exact list of uh, uh, variables right now. So yeah, to take a look at soil grid. I, I can't say for sure if they were actually measured or estimated out of like other functions. Um, but yeah, there are data set uh, indeed available. And this is one of the things, uh, depending on what, what you want to use the model for, or uh, uh, soil grid might work or not. So I think yeah, we also have to talk with soil scientists and also with you, uh, what research question you want to address in the study first. Yeah. 
given the availability of decision analysis and other powerful probabilistic forecast, forecasting tools, it seems data is not lacking so much as clear casual understanding of cropping system. Are there crop modeling approaches that can incorporate uncertainty? Oh yeah, absolutely. In fact, on the AgMe project, I, I hope everyone is familiar with, uh, there was uncertainty kind of working group uh, looking at this. Uncertainty can be incorporated from the uncertainty of the model itself, and also uncertainty in the data, and also uh, estimation and the measurement of, of those data. Yeah, I mean, there are many ways uh, we can do. I mean, there is a whole set of researches going on. I think that was a quite relevant question to address during the webinar, the next webinar on grid-based modeling. Um, so yeah, I, I, yeah, we don't have much time on it, but yeah, I, I will make sure that will be um, yeah, addressed in the next webinar. But yeah, the okay, short answer is yes, yes, there are ways to do that. This question is for Kai. Um, what are the differences between Era 5 and Ag Era 5? It seems that you prefer the former. Well, I don't really have a preference here. The thing is that Ag Era 5 has specific advantages because I think last year, for example, we were using Era 5 in some previous versions like Interim. And um, it's quite a lot of work if you're not fully familiar with Python programming and so on to get to uh, daily data. We, we often only wanted daily data, but then we had hourly, and it took a lot of number crunching to get to that point. So Agera 5 now, basically the, the data providers make that work for you and you can download those specifically. And I found some of the some of the parameters a bit more useful, but also very data sets and they're both available and very much linked to each other. So. No real preference there. It's just ease of use in some cases. How can I acquire or estimate detailed secondary yield and climate data needed for absence simulations without paying without paywalls? Also, how much agroforestry data is out there? Okay, so this is also a good question. Um, there are some data sets uh, out there. It's, it's not specific for FSIM, but yeah, the plot level yield data sets are out there. Um, but it's getting more and more difficult to access that. Um, the couple of reasons that the plot level data comes with coordinate and that are being treated as a personally identifiable information. So you may have more success finding aggregated data than plot level data, which is more useful for crop modern applications. So yeah, this is a similar case. Um, you may not be able to find it in open like data repository, uh, but there are still some data collected from like, for example, CGI research stations when you search uh, through our Guardian uh, website. And, and if you at least know like region and even project that operated in that area uh, yeah, that you think that has data. And oftentimes the researchers or head of the project are willing to share data for specific research focus. So um, yeah, if you are asking how we should uh, access, uh, how we can help you access the data is uh, contact the project leader. So first identify which project might have the data you are looking for and contact the project leader and kind of negotiate and discuss uh, how uh, they can help you access the data and collaborate together. But yeah, I, I agree, it will be, it, it's, it's getting more and more difficult to find like coordinate uh, or uh, a coordinate attached plot level yield data. And yeah, there's a good reason uh, that's the trend in, in this area. Still, we have people um, there, so let's uh, do maybe two more questions. And what are some sources of historical data on rainfall? So before uh, 1900 for South Asia and Africa. Wow, 1900. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> so before so, 1900. Uh, before 1900. Wow, I, I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I don't, I don't know. Like the CRU data goes back to only 1900, only 1900, 1901. Uh, Kai, do you know anything really? pre 1900? No, I mean I've seen some publications where they derive uh, historical data. People who do like paleobotany and and other things. It is somewhere out. I've never used it. Obviously, we don't look at that, but I know that you can derive that from tree rings. So there are a couple of data sets that 
uh, a small group of, of researchers have been using. I would look that up, but obviously it's a time frame I have never looked at. Last year we did, I think, two approaches where we went back to yeah to the early 1900s, and as Jeb was saying, there's only CRU, and we were just looking at yield, which is also almost impossible to find. We need to go back to books, basically, and those things. But um, archaeology, paleobotany, there are some some data sets out there. And of course, some of the global um, climate change models, the ones that are used for backcasting, they also cover previous uh, areas. How reliable, how reliable that is, I don't know, but I've seen um, publications that go back hundreds of years or thousands of years for specific regions. Probably I will just do one more question. Yes, like many of the audience will have interest. What data sets do you both most commonly use for your work and why? <laughs> um, okay, let me go quick uh, first. So all the data we mentioned in this webinar is actually something we use, and, and that was the kind of motivation of, of selecting and, and introducing uh, this data set uh, today. So yeah, no, I, I, and oftentimes you have to have everything in your, you know, uh, in your system. <laughs> so because again, uh, you will get to face different research question. I'm sorry, it's kind of sound like a broken record. And sometimes you need more uh, regional or landscape level data. And sometimes you need really uh, pick, uh, like a point and plot level data. So yeah, just short answer is everything we presented here is something we love and we use uh, for different purposes. Um, and we, there are so many data that new, new data keep coming up and we keep expanding. And yeah, if you are part of, if you are not part of our community yet, uh, please join through yeah, various ways, and yeah, we will keep in touch to to discuss more what new data set we will love and we will. Like yeah. And I think one of the main ones we mentioned it a couple of times. Strangely enough, we didn't put it on the slide, but it fits more into the gridded work. Is obviously WorldClim from UC Davis um, that contains both past, uh, um, future, and time series data often at very high resolution, so for a lot of stuff. And for most of the, the baseline calculations we've done in our gridded models, for example, that is one of the sources. Yeah, but absolutely. Saying everything we've shown today is something we've actually used or hoping to use in the very near future. I'm pretty sure that I realized when we are putting the slides together, there's probably a lot more. So if people have additional new, especially new data sets that are coming online, please share them. We'll be happy to put them out and, and test them and communicate that too. Uh, exactly. And, and also, that there will be an excellent question to ask the audience. Uh, maybe next time when we have um, the grid based modeling, we will ask you to also uh, answer that or what, what's your favorite data set and why. And yeah, maybe we can use that in the uh, presentation as well. Thank you very much, um, Yo Wen Kai, <clears throat> for us answering so many questions and your excellent presentation. As Yo Wu already commented, so please follow us, join our newsletter from the Crop Model and the Geospatial Community of Practice to stay tuned about like our following webinars. And now I'm going to turn up to Matthew Reynolds, the Crop Modeling Community of Practice leader, to do a brief wrap up. Thank you very much. Yeah, hi everyone. Um... Well, just very briefly, because we're a bit over. First of all, thank you very much, Jawu and Kai. We are very lucky to have their input on this subject. That's, they're a bit of a dream team uh, with a, a lot of uh, expertise and global, very global perspective. So thank you very much. Um, on the questions, last time I checked, they were hardly heading towards 100. Uh, as, as Annabelle said, uh, um, we couldn't get all of them. Blame me if you didn't get your question in. I tried to focus on general interest ones, but obviously there were many more, so we only did the what we could. Guardian portal. So Kai mentioned that. That is a resource, a very valuable resource for people who, especially in a, a lockdown period, for accessing data sets. So if you haven't checked out the Guardian portal, uh, highly recommended. And lastly, if I may, use the prerogative of rather than me having the last word i'll let kyle jewu have the last word 
in response to this question on secondary data sets. Are, are secondary data sets mm. available for disease and pest incidents at a regional or local level? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I was hoping we don't get that question. Um, so for some disease and like local thing in East Africa and with uh, with uh, blast and uh, with rust disease, and there are some surveillance systems going on and, and there are some data sets out there. Um, connecting that to crop modeling application is not an easy uh, task. And yeah, actually, I, I, I did some work on that. And yeah, I will be happy to present that in the next presentation. And that, that was all in grid-based uh, applications. And so yeah, short answers, yes, but only to some uh, limited set of uh, pathogens and insects. And yeah, there are some international initiatives to bring that uh, to the modeling community, uh, vice versa. So yeah, I think, yeah, I'll be happy to introduce that in the next webinar. Great. Well, thanks very much, guys, and everyone for their part, for your participation. And we'll see you all on the next webinar. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank have you. a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah,